Okay. In the last uh, uh, three days, we talked about um, statistics, uh, so descriptive statistics, uh, and in particular, we focused on inferential statistics. Uh, however, and, and clearly, when you do a field experiment, inferential statistics is the, uh, the, the one thing that you are, you are going to use the most. However, clearly, that is not the only, uh, the only type of statistics. There are many other uh, ways of, of doing statistics. Uh, and everything depends on the type of data you are dealing with. Uh, one, of the, um, uh, one of the other techniques that is uh, uh, normally used in engineering is time series analysis. Um, and uh, again, time series is, um, uh, is simple to understand. So uh, time series is uh, when you record a series of data uh, at regular time intervals. Uh, it could be data coming from sensor or machinery data or wh whatever, whatever data uh, you prefer. But uh, the, the, the main thing is that the, these data are recorded uh, at regular time intervals. Uh, most of the time, uh, what you want to achieve with time series analysis uh, is, uh, well, first of all, detect the um, subset if you want to, to have uh, um, to subset the, the, the time series. Uh, sometimes you have uh, too many data, so you want it to to either extract the data or uh, uh, normalize it somehow. Uh, but then the most important thing is detect changes. Uh, because clearly, uh, sometimes you want to detect uh, if there is a, a, a particular change in the data. Uh, it could be an anomaly with the machinery, or it could be uh, something else. But the, 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 the main thing with time series analysis uh, is that you need to detect changes. And the way to detect changes is other by looking at the general trend. Uh, so if it's uh, normally a, an increasing trend, then you see a changes. Uh, mm -hmm. Changes, for example, I, the trend start decreasing, that it, it, this could, uh, uh, could, could be an anomaly, or uh, by detecting outliers, so, so values that are extreme compared to um, what you get uh, historically. So now if we look at the, at the R script, uh, for this lecture we will use uh, two packages, a package called XTS and a package called Forecast. Uh, Forecast should be already installed in your system, but please install uh, XTS. Uh, again, using the, um, the same uh, uh, procedure we learned uh, the other two days, so just, you just um, type XTS in this install uh, window in, uh, in RStudio, and then you can, you can just run these two lines and load the packages. No, actually, I had it, uh, I thought it was installed. Actually, it's not installed, so it, it's, give me, it's giving me an error. So I need to install forecast first. Now it's installed, so I can I can uh, load it again. So I run again those two lines, uh, and now they they don't return any error because the two packages are there. So for this uh, uh, lecture, I prepare two data set, um, and for that I used uh, um, data set coming from uh, the Environmental Protection Agency in the U.S. Um, I developed a function, actually, at, I, I presented it on my blog, to download data from the EPA. Uh, so the function is, uh, is this one. So it, it's extremely long. It's a bit complex. But basically what it does, it, uh, it allows you to download uh, every type of data because it, uh, they, they, they provide data for a series of parameters, wind, temperature, pressure, etc. And they provide data for hour, hourly, daily, or, or annual data. Uh, for this lecture, I prepared uh, <coughs> um, hourly data. So I downloaded hourly data for temperature and uh, uh, PM10, which is particle matter of, uh, of size uh, 10, 
um, micron, I think. Um, and then, because clearly when you download data from the EPA, uh, you, you are not just downloading one set of data, but you are downloading data for, for the whole US. So then I, I just randomly extract one particular station for, from the whole network and, um, and, and created these two CSV files. So you can find the CSV file on the Learning Hub in the folder dataset. So they are uh, pm10.csv and temperature.csv. Uh, if you just uh, uh, download these two CSV and put it in the same folder when you have uh, the RND script, they, they will be, uh, R will be able to load them. Uh, however, uh, I also include them uh, in my GitHub. So if you have, again, the, the as, as we did yesterday or, or, or a few days ago, if you have the library rcurl installed, then you can you can run this line and have those data uh, downloaded directly from my GitHub. As you can see from the table, uh, this data they basically have three uh, columns, so they are they are uh, relatively simple data, but they have a lot of of observations. So I have around nine thousand observations because I have uh, hourly. Uh, hourly data for a whole year. Uh, and basically what I have here, I have a, a date, uh, which is in this particular format with forward slashes, uh, dividing um, day, month, and year. And then I have uh, uh, the time, uh, which again is, is your normal hourly uh, values. And then what uh, sample measurement is the actual uh, variable measure. So it can be uh, temperature or uh, or the PM10. Because they are uh, coming from the EPA, so for, from the US, this data, so the sample measurement, uh, is in Fahrenheit. So the first thing I'm, I'm doing here is actually creating a new uh, column in the data frame, because for the time being, this is just a data frame uh, that I'm importing from, from a CSV file. So I'm creating a new column called temp C, which stands for temperature in, in Celsius. And then I'm simply transforming uh, the data from Fahrenheit to, uh, to Celsius. Um, and yeah, the, the same is, uh, is true for, for PM10. You get exactly the same values. However, now they are integers because it's just the uh, value of, uh, of the, the amount of PM10, PM10 in the air. So now, we can start with the, um, the, the, the bit that it's, uh, it's specific for uh, time series data. Because clearly, one, one, one thing we need to, uh, to do now is allow R to understand that this data are, uh, have timestamps. So the, the, the thing we, so there are basically there are particular categories of uh, the particular data types uh, that we can use. So it, it, the, in the first uh, lecture, we, we explore the type of data, so a vector, data frame, etc., and the type of variable. So the, we have integers, we have uh, a numerical variable, we have logical variable, categories, etc. Uh, for, for time data, time and date, we have another a new category, which is uh, uh, the POSIX CT category. Uh, and basically, this is a particular type of data uh, that is just timestamps. So the, now what we need to do is uh, um, basically allow R to recognize uh, the format uh, of the two uh, columns, date and time. So <coughs> I can just, if I just copy and paste this line to a new file. So basically here we have a series of, of nested functions. The first function is paste. And basically, this function is exactly the same as you do in, in, uh, in Word. So here, I'm just pasting all the elements of the uh, column date uh, dot local with all the elements of the, of the column type, uh, of the column time. So basically, uh, I obtain, instead of two uh, separate strings uh, with a date and a time, I, I obtain uh, a series of uh, strings with both informations. OK, so now what I can do is I can use the function s.posixct, including these uh, uh, new strings, uh, and then providing the format uh, of uh, 
uh, of these new streams. So as I said, here the format is day, forward slash month, forward slash year with four digits, uh, and then space, uh, and then hour, and, and, uh, and minutes. So basically here I'm just telling R exactly what, what we said now, that we have days, forward slash month, forward slash year, etc. Um, there is, uh, I provide a link here somehow, uh, here, uh, this link uh, provides you with all the information you need if you have different formats. So clearly sometimes you have uh, timestamps uh, with dashes or, or, or different symbols uh, and R is very flexible in, uh, in this sort of thing, so you, you can provide different formats. Um, we, we can actually check the first element uh, of this new uh, vector, uh, because now from a string uh, we, we are actually creating uh, um, a, a timestamp. So in this case you can recognize that R is actually, um, uh, is actually recognizing this as a timestamp because it will give you the, the GNT as um, um, the GMT, so that it, you know it, uh, it has recognized uh, uh, the string as, as time. So basically now, if what, what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm basically collecting, uh, I'm, I'm creating two new objects, uh, datetime.temp, uh, with this uh, temporal information uh, for the, the data frame temp, and, um, and, and the new object for, uh, as again, the same for the data set uh, uh, PM10. So if I just run these two lines, uh, as, as, I, as I told you before, now the, the R has recognized these two as uh, timestamps, uh, and uh, it, will, it will give you basically the same thing, but uh, you know that, uh, for example, it, it has recognized uh, that this value comes before this value, uh, and it comes uh, uh, before of, of exactly an hour. So this is uh, particularly handy if you want to, to do a time series analysis. Um, so clearly now what I need to do is I need to include uh, this new information, so thi this new data type uh, into the, the, um, the data frame. And, the, uh, and again, it's very simple. I can just create uh, uh, new columns uh, in, the, in the two data frame uh, with the objects we just created. And here I can actually add a, a new line uh, to show you how, how the, the new data frame look like. So basically now, for, the, for example, in temperature, I have, uh, again, the same two columns, uh, date local and time local, which are treats uh, as strings uh, or factors. And then I have sample <coughs> measurement, uh, which again, this was the original one in Fahrenheit. And then I have this new column temperature C, which is uh, what I use to, to transform the data into Celsius. And then last, the last thing is uh, a new column and as you can see here, the, the type of data is actually the POSIX, POSIX uh, CT uh, type. So I know that this column will be recognized by R as, uh, as temporal information. So once I have, uh, once I have this, this data, I can simply call the function XTS, uh, which stands for, again, time series. Uh, and uh, the only thing I need to, uh, to provide to this function is the, the, the actual observation of the variable, uh, which can be, um, in, uh, for, for, for the PM10 example, is the sample measurement. For the temperature example, is the, the, the new column in, uh, in Celsius. And then with the option order by, I, I simply include the new uh, column with, uh, with temporal information. We can actually check uh, the format uh, of these two new objects uh, by including str for, for structure. So again, if I run again these two lines, uh, as you can see, the, the, the object temp.ts uh, is uh, an xts object uh, that contains uh, uh, the, the same amount of information, but uh, now you have uh, uh, data, so you have all these uh, values in Celsius, and then you have the index for uh, for time. Uh, and once I have that, I can simply call plot, because again, it, uh, plot is one of these other functions that works uh, differently depending on the, the type of, uh, of object you provide. So if you provide a plot uh, for, uh, uh, and, and you provide a formula, it will, it will create a scatter plot. In this case, I'm just providing uh, 
the, the time series. Uh, so the plot function knows that this is a time series and it will plot it as a time series. A and this is exactly what, uh, what is showing here. Uh, in uh, R, um, the, the function, the, the package XTS is not uh, actually the only one that you can use to import and work with time series data. There is a function TS in base R that, that can, w can create uh, time series data. Uh, however, um, I, I, br I prefer to work with, uh, with the package XTS because it's a lot more flexible. So for example, if you want to uh, subset your data, um, with the function TS, uh, you need to work uh, as if it was a data frame. Uh, with the package XTS, uh, you, have, you just need to open the square bracket, and then you can, you can use uh, an actual date to, to subset the data. So for example, in this case, let's say I want to subset uh, this uh, whole time series and just extract the values for, uh, for the whole month of March. So I can just say, uh, I can just again open the square bracket, which is uh, a, a, um <coughs> a syntax uh, that is consistent with. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, it's a syntax that is consistent with uh, the way we 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 learn to subset data frame. So again, you just open the square bracket, uh, and then you include a string with uh, year and month. Clearly, you don't include the day because you don't want to, to extract a single day. You want to extract the full month, uh, but you can, you can just do it. So again, it's, uh, it's, it's simple. It's also a bit intuitive because you, you can just um, type uh, the, the month that you want to extract, uh, and it works. So again, if we, if we just run this line, this would be uh, data for just the month of, of March. And again, if you want to do the same, so for example, you want to uh, extract a range of values. So let's say from uh, the 14th uh, to the 16th of, of July, you can just uh, uh, again open square brackets and then include uh, the two date uh, separated by, by a slash. And, that, and uh, again, it's, it's extremely simple and uh, it's intuitive. So again, in the one, one of the, um, the, the the pros of actually using this syntax is that if you go back to your script uh, later on, uh, you will be able to understand exactly what you did because uh, it's extremely intuitive to, to recognize that this is uh, a, a subset call and you're just ex uh, subsetting uh, and so extracting values for a couple of days. So again, if we just run these two lines, then we will see data for, uh, for those two days. Uh, and again, I included a PDF uh, for with more uh, uh, information on how to subset uh, because clearly these are just two examples so there are a lot more uh, subsetting that you can do if you have more than one year you can just subset an year uh, if you have uh, you can subset weeks uh, so uh, th there's a lot of stuff that you can do in uh, in STS so as I, as I mentioned in at the very beginning uh, one of the key points uh, of time series analysis uh, is detect changes and again there are a series of ways to detect changes uh, and one of the, uh, the most basic way is to, um, to see the general trend of a time series and maybe um, check the differences in trends for a particular uh, subset of your time series. Um, and because the general trend is simply fitting a line through the time series, uh, we can simply do that uh, uh, with the function lm. So ag exactly the same that we used yesterday for the linear regression, uh, we can use it to fit a line through uh, time series data. And again, you are inputting a function in uh, um, within the call to, to lm, because as we, as, as we said yesterday, uh, the call to lm always needs to include a, a function. And in this case, the function is simply uh, the uh, data within your, your time series. Uh, so in this case, because we are talking about uh, temperature, this will be the data in, uh, in degrees. Uh, and the function core data is simply a, a, a function you can use uh, to extract uh, the data from the time series. So again, this, these are exactly the same values uh, in the column temp C. 
but because now they are included in a, in a time series object, uh, to extract them, you need to use the core data function. And then the same index will extract the temporal index uh, from the, the ST object. And again, if you, if you run uh, this line, uh, the object Ltrend will simply be uh, exactly the same type of object we used yesterday for, uh, uh, for the, the, the time series. So we can call summary with LL trend, L trend, and the summary will look exactly the same as the one we saw yesterday for linear regression. However, clearly now we are not really interested in, in the summary or the p-value. We are just interested in, uh, in the line. Um, and the way you actually use this, uh, um, the, the output of the, the, the LM function to fit a line, uh, you basically plot again uh, um, the, the values for, uh, uh, for the month of March. But here, instead of plotting the whole time series, uh, you are plotting uh, index and core data separately. So clearly, the index uh, is on the x-axis, because the time usually is on the x-axis and uh, uh, the data is on the y-axis. And then you, you include the function lines, uh, and the function lines uh, is similar to the function points uh, we used in, in the first lecture. So it, uh, it allows you to overlay additional, um, additional elements on top of an existing plot. So in this case, it will add the uh, fitted line uh, to, the, to the main plot. So if you, can, if you just run these two lines, uh, then you will obtain uh, the time series for March plus the general trend, which in this case is an, is incre an increasing trend. Other uh, important functions that are available in the package uh, XTS, which are extremely useful, is the, uh, a series of apply functions. So you have a series of functions. Uh, so you have, for example, apply daily, which we are going to use here applied monthly, you have applied weekly, you have a series of applied function uh, that are extremely useful because, for example, sometimes you don't want to have uh, a general trend for the whole month, but you want to calculate uh, the daily mean because the, the, time to the, the, the hourly data are, uh, are too dense for you, or maybe you have sub-hour data and you want to get the hourly data, so you can apply, there is a function apply uh, hourly, clearly, that we are not going to use here because my data are collected hourly, uh, but sometimes uh, you want to uh, sort of uh, uh, decrease uh, the frequency of your time series because uh, uh, many times uh, the, the if you have too many information, then, then you also have a lot of noise, so you want to normalize uh, your output. Uh, and with this series of functions, you can do it very quickly. So for example, uh, for apply daily, the only thing you, you need to supply is the time series and then the function you want to use. So again, in the, in here we are, we are calculating the mean value for each day in the time series. Um, and again, it's extremely simple. And, and you, can, you can see the results by, by just um, uh, plotting the daily temperature. Because the, the, the new object daily temperature, uh, because it's coming from, from an, an XTS object, will still be an XTS object with clearly less data. So now we have 365 data because we have 365 days in a year. Uh, but it, it, will, it, it, you, it can be treated the same way you, you treated the other XTS objects so far. Um, and again, this is a, a very good way to uh, decrease the amount of information, so decrease the, the noise in, in your data. Uh, here I'm uh, actually showing uh, uh, let's say a more advanced way of using these apply uh, functions uh, because here I, I'm uh, including a, a customized function so that the function I write the function myself uh, clearly in <coughs> within this uh, this call you can use all the function available in R so you could calculate the mean the median the standard deviation you can calculate the interquartile range all the function we used so far can be used here however for uh, uh, other things, so for example, in this case, I want to calculate the, the slope of uh, the trend line for each month. So in this case, I, I, I need to include a, a custom function uh, in, in the call. And the custom function, uh, you can just input function and x, which x basically is uh, the vector of values 
from each iteration of the function. So I, I, the x will be uh, the, the all the, the values of uh, temperature in Celsius for each month. Because the apply function, what it does is simply uh, doing a sort of for loop. So for each month, the function subset the whole month, extract all the values, apply the function, and return returns the, the, the value uh, at the end. So in this case, what I'm doing, I'm uh, uh, fitting a line through this, uh, these x values, which again are values for each month. And then I'm extracting the coefficient, the second coefficient of the LM call. The, the first coefficient clearly will be the intercept, so the beta 0. The second coefficient would be the slope of this line. So in this case, what I'm doing is uh, uh, applying this function iteratively to each month uh, and then uh, extracting the, the slope of the line. And uh, what this will return is a series of slopes. So again, uh, because we saw that, for example, in March, the slope was positive, and clearly this is a positive slope. Um, but one thing we can, we can see, for example, here is that we have a sort of anomaly in, uh, in February um, because we have uh, a, a positive slope in January, a positive slope in March, meaning that uh, on average the temperature value are increasing from the first day to the last day of the month. But then we have a, a negative ano anomaly in, uh, uh, in February. So this, this can give us an indication that something has changed in that particular month. And because, I mean, clearly here we are, we are working with environmental data, but this could be machinery data. So again, if you are expecting the machinery to behave in a certain way over a certain time period, this will give you an indication that then actually there's something wrong uh, for that particular time, uh, uh, time value. Uh, so again, uh, for example, in this case, I'm extracting the, the temperature for January because um, maybe we, we, we wouldn't expect, it, we, we, we were not expecting the temperature to increase. So again, I can just uh, um, go back and from this output, uh, then I can, I can zoom in into a particular month and say, okay, that w that's, that's exactly what, what is going on in that particular month. Uh, and clearly, th this sort of function are extremely useful because particularly with, uh, uh, let's say, sensor data, sometimes sensor data, they take a measurement every minute. So at the end of, of, uh, of a full year, you will have a massive amount of data. And uh, going back and check manually all this data uh, will be extremely difficult. It, it will, it, you will lose a lot of time. So this sort of function, they can give you a, a, a quick way to automatically check uh, all your data at once and then maybe go back and, uh, and uh, focus on particular aspect of your data that you can find problematic. I, I also included a, a section about decomposition <coughs> uh, because clearly my background in on is on environmental data and decomposition is one of those, uh, uh, those key points for environmental data. Uh, however, for machinery, this is not really something that you would use because you don't have uh, um, probably you don't, you don't have more than one trend in for machinery. Probably you have a, just a general trend. However, for environmental data, you have more than one trend. So you have uh, for temperature, you have a daily trend because clearly temperature uh, during the day are, are higher compared to during the night. You have a seasonal trend. Um, so you have a series of, uh, of nested trends within the same time series. Uh, and decomposition is one of those techniques that you can use uh, to actually extract uh, just uh, the, the, the main signal. So exclude all these, uh, uh, these additional trends. Uh, and basically, the way you, you do it uh, is uh, to uh, set the frequency of your time series. Uh, and again, I, I, I wrote something here. I will not go into detail now because it, it's too long. But basically, the, the frequency will depend on the, the, the actual trend you want to exclude. So in this case, I input 24 because it's, we have 24 hours in a day. Uh, but you can also include other, uh, other values to focus on different aspects and different, uh, uh, different components <coughs> of the time series. And then once you have that, you can simply um, call the this particular function, and this function will give you uh, the data, the seasonal trend, 
the general trend, which is what we calculated before with the apply daily, and then it will give you uh, the remaining signal. So all the signal that is not related to seasonal trend is not related to general trend. Um, it, I mean, it can be considered noise, but actually most of the time we are actually interested in this, uh, in this signal because uh, if there are any anomalies, the, the, this is where, where you can find them. And clearly, the output of, of this function can be further subsetted. So if we want to simply focus on the seasonal component, uh, we can simply subset uh, this, uh, uh, this new object, which would be probably a matrix, and then simply say, OK, this, is, this would be um, the, the seasonal component of the first uh, 21 days of the, of the function. And then clearly, you will see that, uh, uh, that you will have, uh, you, you will have this, this particular component. Uh, the main trend, again, is, the, is what we computed before with, with daily values, it, uh, and it can be computed again with this, uh, uh, this, this, this decomposition function. Uh, and as I said, the w one thing we are very interested in is the, the, the final part of, uh, of the course, so the, the, what the, 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 what the signal that remains after excluding all these trends. And uh, we are interested in this particular signal because it will give us uh, indication that we probably that are probably not uh, uh, not so evident. So, for example, if I run this function, I, ca I will calculate the correlogram of uh, uh, the time series, uh, and the correlogram is basically the correlation between each time points uh, and everything that is uh, before and after that particular time point. The fact, for example, that I see still uh, a sort of trend in this data tells me that there is an additional an additional trend that I haven't considered. So in this case, as you can see, the trend is a 12-hour trend, uh, because clearly you can see that these two uh, maxima are separated by 24 hours. So I have this 12-hour trend that, uh, that I didn't consider at the, at the very beginning of this decomposition. Uh, so again, it, will, it, it can give me uh, indication about uh, a residual trend that, uh, that I couldn't find in the data. I mean, the 12-hour trend is actually something that uh, is known in literature to be, uh, uh, to be evident in, in, in this sort of temperature um, time series. Uh, but this is clearly a way that you can, you can use to extract this, uh, this information. Again, um, one thing we, we actually did with, with trend is uh, we, we were able to fit lines uh, to particular subsets of our time series. Uh, and then with the line, we were able to detect uh, possible anomalies and changes uh, in, uh, in our time series. Another way uh, we can use uh, to, uh, to detect these changes uh, is uh, by detecting outliers. Uh, outliers is a, gen a very general term that indicates uh, uh, values that are extreme, so values that are very um, are, are very distant from the mean. So again, if you uh, imagine your uh, uh, normal distribution, uh, outliers will be values in the two tails of the distribution, so values that are very distant from the mean value. However, as I said, it, this is a very general trend. Uh, and it can, it can be used for, uh, for uh, many different uh, uh, reasons. So for example, if we take a look at the, uh, the time series of the, the, um, um, the, the particle matters of size 10, we can see a series of peaks. Clearly, with this, with this time series, we cannot really see a, a general trend or a seasonal trend, but we can see peaks. So now we want to see if these peaks are, are actually outliers and, and they are actually something that we need to worry about. Um, so I went to the EPA website and what I found is that the, um, the limit for PM10 is uh, 150 microgram per, per square meter over 24 hour periods. So we can use this information if, if we have this information and, and if we have, for, for example, machinery data, I mean, we should know what is the, the normal range of, of value that we should expect from, uh, uh, from, from, from this time series. So we can, we can have uh, ranges of, uh, of, uh, of alerts. So we can say, OK, if, if the value goes above or below a certain threshold, then it, it will give us uh, an alert. 
so in this case, uh, what I'm doing is I'm simply uh, applying again the, the function daily because it's uh, over 24 hour period. So I need to understand how many times uh, the, um, the value of PM10 goes above 150 on a daily basis. Um, and again, I can just copy and paste this line to a new script and then I can show you exactly what it's doing. So basically I have, uh, uh, again, three different uh, elements of this line. I have uh, the function apply daily, which again calculates the mean value of, uh, of the time series on a daily basis. So uh, if I just run this line, it will give me a series of mean values for each day of the year. And then what I'm saying with, uh, uh, with this further call is uh, uh, to basically uh, check whether these mean values are above or below 150. And this line will, will basically return a, a logical vector. So again, it will return either true or false. It's, if it's true, it means that uh, the mean value is above 150. If it's false, it means that it's either equal or below 150. And then with sum, uh, I can, I can uh, um, basically sum all the true values uh, within these uh, within this, uh, logical vectors. So every time you see a, a true value here, it will be treated as one uh, by, by the function sum. So it will return uh, uh, the number of days in which actually <coughs> this uh, this uh, legal limit is, uh, uh, is, um, is, is passed. So basically here you, you can see that the, the, the function return the value uh, 6, <coughs> which tells me that uh, 6 days uh, during this year, this legal threshold was, tr this legal limit was, uh, was passed. And then what I, what I can do is um, I can also check the anomalies on the time series. Uh, and uh, here I can, for example, I can uh, extract exactly the days in which, uh, um, in which this, uh, uh, this anomaly happened uh, by subsetting the, um, the index object of this variable, so just the temporal information. And again, I can just copy and paste this to a new, uh, a new file to show you the function which. So basically, the function which uh, extracts the, uh, the ID along this, uh, um, this um, logical vector. So every time this logical vector is true, instead of uh, extracting a true value, it will tell me exactly the position along this vector. So the, the, the element uh, that is true within this vector. So let's say uh, if the vector was of 10 elements, and the third element was a true value, this, the, the function which, which will return the value 3. So basically, this function will return a series of, uh, of integers. And these integers are the uh, values along this vector that are, are true in, uh, for, for this particular call of, uh, of, uh, of, of the function. So then I can simply extract with the square bracket all these values from, uh, from the temporal index. And this will give me exactly which days of the year I, I, I got this, uh, um, uh, this i value of, uh, of PM10. As I mentioned earlier, uh, the term outlier is, uh, is very general. Okay? So um, f before we used the outlier as value that were above uh, the legal limit. But there's also a statistical definition of outlier uh, as extreme value. And we can use uh, uh, this, this statistical definition uh, to check our time series. So for example, if we, if we take a look at this normal distribution, um, so we have the, the mean value in, in the middle of the distribution, and then we have the standard deviation. So normally, uh, values that are two times uh, the standard deviation away from the mean uh, can be considered outlier because 95% of the values will be included within the interval uh, mean plus or minus two times the standard deviation. So actually the, the, the real value is 1.98, but uh, you can normally consider two times the standard deviation. 
uh, and then 99% of, of uh, values uh, will be included in uh, plus, or plus or minus 2.6. Uh, so again, we can, we can consider it 3. So 3 times the standard deviation. Okay? So if we are uh, considering uh, values that are uh, above or below these intervals, we, will, we will be looking at, uh, at uh, extremely unlikely values uh, in our time series. We can actually check uh, um, those, uh, those um, outliers or, ex let's say, extreme values, because clearly the, the, the fact that they are uh, uh, extreme values, that does not necessarily mean that th these are outliers. <coughs> the term outliers normally refer to values that are, uh, are not consistent uh, with, the, with the data, so it could be error uh, in, in the sensor taking the measurement or, or again, anomalies. Uh, in, in the way that the machine functions, but the fact they are extreme it doesn't really mean anything. We, need, we still need to check uh, uh, manually what, uh, what each of these outliers actually means. Uh, so again, if we, can, we can use the function ist to uh, create a histogram of uh, uh, all the data included in, um, uh, in the, um, the time series, and then we can use the function abiline which again is one of those functions that again is like points and lines, uh, is able to uh, overlay new information on top of, uh, of an existing plot. Uh, so in this case, I'm uh, uh, plotting vertical lines with the function v, and these vertical lines uh, are uh, um, um, basically uh, plotted as uh, on, on the, the y-coordinate uh, mean plus two times the standard deviation and mean minus uh, two times the standard deviation. And then I'm, I'm using the color red to actually pl plot these lines. Uh, and as you can see, we have uh, a series of, uh, of, of data that are uh, um, above and below these thresholds. So then we can use this information to actually check um, which, which of these data uh, are, um, are, are, are extreme in our, in our distribution. So we can, we can actually use uh, uh, the, this outlier and, and then check whether they are, they are in fact uh, um, outliers or they are extreme values. I mean, it, it may be that they are just extreme values and, uh, and we, are, we don't uh, need, really need to, to worry. Um, uh, here I'm also um, using, a, again, a different function. Um, so in this case, it's a, it's a for loop. And what I'm doing is I'm looping through uh, values from 1 to 10, uh, which would be months, so clearly months 1 to, to 12. Uh, and uh, what I'm doing is I'm basically subsetting the time series, computing mean and standard deviation, and then um, computing these outliers, but not for the whole time series as we did before, but for specific months. Uh, and this, uh, uh, clearly, it's, it's a it, it may be a bit more useful because if you, for particularly if you are working with uh, environmental data, uh, the fact that you are considering the, the whole distribution means that, that you are considering values in winter that are probably uh, lower uh, or much lower compared to the average and, and values in summer that are probably much higher compared to the average. Uh, and this clearly happens uh, with a lot of, of environmental data. Uh, so in some cases, you want to be a bit more specific in, uh, in, the, in, the, in the search for outliers, uh, and you want to zoom in into a particular uh, uh, subset of your time series. And, and this sort of, uh, of, uh, of loop can actually help you uh, with that, because clearly here we are, we are subsetted by month, but you could, you could subset by day or week or, or whatever you like. So we can, we can simply run uh, this uh, loop. And clearly, you don't see any output because we are not actually printing anything for this loop. So this loop is simply creating an, uh, a, a new, um, or basically, is, is replacing uh, values in this uh, object called out.ts, and is actually replacing objects uh, by subsetting uh, the, um, this, this new time series, which I created based on the, the, the temp time series and is replacing object with, uh, with these outliers. So basically, this time series uh, will just have values uh, when, uh, when, when we, we, we probably have outliers. Because if, I, if you see from this 
uh, function here, the custom function that I'm applying, I'm basically saying that uh, if the value is above uh, mean plus twice the, standard twice the standard deviation or below mean minus twice the standard deviation, then you, you still keep the value. So you, you provide the time series with the, the actual value. However, if it's uh, uh, below, so it's included in the, in the normal, let's say the normal interval, you just give an NA. So basically this new time series will have a series of, uh, of NAs um, for the majority of, uh, of the time. It, it will always all, all only have uh, data for particular time intervals. We can actually take a look uh, specifically at this particular time series uh, by including a new call plot and, and plot this time series. So again, if I run this line, then you see instead of having all the values, I just have little pieces of, uh, of information. And this would be the, the monthly outliers that, that we are interested in, uh, in looking at. Uh, so one, one thing I, I could do uh, is I could plot both time series, one on, to on top of the other, uh, again with the function lines. So basically what I'm doing here, I'm, I'm plotting the, the basic, so the, the, the raw data, uh, the raw temperature data, and then uh, with the function lines, I'm, uh, I'm plotting on top of the normal time series, the new time series colored in red. So then I, uh, with, with these two lines, um, I can actually look at the whole time series with just those uh, outliers highlighted in, in red, which again, it, it could be particularly useful if, you are, uh, if this is what, what you need to do. So as I said, this was the, 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 final, uh, um, the final bit of information I want to share with you today for, for time series. Um, I mean, in terms of, uh, of what we learned today, I mean, uh, for time series, the, 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 the majority of time, what you are really need to, to, to be doing is, is uh, extracting maybe trends uh, or be able to detect possible outliers, uh, extreme values, etc. Uh, however, there are a lot of, of other things you could do. So for example, you could use, uh, uh, you could try to model uh, the time series and, and forecast it. So you, you, for example, if you have uh, um, values of temperature or values of, of, of different things and you want to try to forecast what would happen in the next day, uh, then clearly if you have additional source of information, you could use a regression, like a linear regression. But there are other ways to use uh, the signal already available in the time series to, to forecast, so to generate uh, uh, values uh, for future events. Uh, I'm, I, I did not cover this aspect uh, in this lecture, but there is a, a, a free book uh, that, uh, that you, if you want, you can, uh, it's all based on R, uh, and it's available uh, for free online by Professor Inman from Australia. And basically this book will, will talk specifically about forecasting because clearly there are a series of, of techniques that you can use. Uh, so uh, I, I included this as, um, um, as a reference at, at, the, at the end of, uh, of this lecture. Um, other references, clearly I, I included other stuff. Uh, the majority of these references can be uh, accessed uh, um, for free. Um, and again, on, on my OneDrive, you will find uh, a lot of, uh, of material for time series as well as for all the other topics we, we, uh, we covered in these uh, this lectures. And then once again, there are a series of homeworks that if you want, you can, uh, you can use uh, as a suggestion to, to do something uh, with, uh, with R.